virtually all New Testament scholars believe Jesus existed. There are only a handful of people who have studied the subject in detail and proposed that he did not exist, and of this handful, the majority are not employed researching and teaching New Testament studies at academic institutions. There are only a couple of such voices, and this is out of thousands of scholars employed to research and teach the New Testament. As we now know, the percentage required for a consensus is 97, and while climate scientists may struggle to reach that figure, I doubt New Testament scholars would have much problem. Of course, consensus aren't always right. They can be changed by the discovery of new evidence or by the reinterpretation of existing evidence. Changes of the latter kind have three characteristic stages. In the first stage, a small number of visionaries challenge the consensus, but they are ignored by other scholars. In the second stage, the visionary position starts to attract adherence, but it is bitterly opposed by the majority. Then in the third stage, the visionary position becomes accepted, with the caveat that we've always known that. This process takes a predictable amount of time because most scholars decide what they're going to believe early in their careers and spend the rest of their careers trying to justify their position. They rarely change their minds, so the consensus only changes when they're replaced. That's all very well looking back on past academic revolutions, but looking forward it is not so easy, because for every visionary who's challenging the consensus, there are scores of cranks also challenging the consensus, and telling which ones are the visionaries at the time isn't easy. Mythicists give several reasons for the historicist consensus, all of which do have some traction. One of these is that most scholars are paid to be historicists. That sounds a little disingenuous, and it would be more accurate to say that most scholars are paid because they are historicists. It is true that there are far more people employed in New Testament scholarship than would be purely by secular interest, because of the Christian Church's large educational effort. And obviously people employed in the Church are likely to be Christians and therefore historicists. The number of posts in New Testament studies in secular academic institutions is small compared to the number in religious institutions. Another reason given by mythicists is academic authority. Scholars working on ancient texts tend to trust the judgment of other scholars working on different ancient texts more than they trust the judgment of noisy mavericks or internet pundits. That means that the large number of scholars who do not specialise in the evidence for Jesus' existence tend to defer to those few who do. A third reason given by mythicists is that the current academic system punishes people who challenge the consensus, making it difficult for them to publish their research, difficult to gain funding and difficult to achieve career advancement. The Journal of Higher Criticism was set up in order to give a publication place for mythicists because they were having a hard time publishing elsewhere. The same phenomenon is seen in creation studies where they have their own journals because mainstream science won't publish them. The historicist side don't really give a reason why they hold the consensus. They don't need to, because their argument goes, well, virtually all scholars agree, therefore it must be true. If pressed, they'd probably say something like, well, the evidence indicates that Jesus existed, therefore anybody who studies it in detail is likely to come to the same conclusion, unless they have some kind of axe to grind. And that assertion is true, but it is specifically true when the particular methods of interpretation used by scholars are applied. And to see this, we need to understand what scholarship is like. Scholarship involves many experts forming, publishing and defending their ideas to other experts, and that means many people have to agree on the meaning of a text. It's obviously going to be easier to get people to agree if the meaning is what a plain reading would suggest. So, for example, the modern scholarly position on the Old Testament command not to eat pork means don't eat pork. It does not mean don't behave like a pig, for example. Secular scholars default to the plain reading meaning of a text and don't favour hidden meanings or deliberate deceit on the part of the author. These things do, of course, occur, but the default position in the absence of evidence to the contrary is to accept the plain reading of a text. This differs from faith-based reading because in that reading the primary default position is that the text is infallible, and therefore if what it appears to say clearly isn't true or it contradicts itself, the problem is not that the author is confused or doesn't agree with another author, 
No, the problem is that we are wrongly reading a plain meaning into the text. There must be a deeper meaning that we need to work out, and when we do, the discrepancies will no longer exist. So the scholarly reading is plain, the religious reading is deep. Religious people apply this kind of deep reading only to the text they believe to be holy. For example, a Christian thinks the whole Bible is holy and reads it deeply. A religious Jewish person thinks that the Tanakh is holy and reads it deeply, but reads the New Testament in a scholarly, plain way. Now, scholarship involves publishing things that are interesting or useful. An example of a useful thing is proposing ways of telling whether a text represents historical fact or fiction. And many criteria for this have been proposed over the years by scholars. These have been variously ignored, challenged, debated and tested. Consensus have formed that some of these are good methods of telling history from fiction and some are not. It is agreed that if something is attested by multiple independent sources, it probably happened. Another criteria is that something is likely not to have happened if it is not consistent with what else we know about the time period. A third criteria is often referred to as the criteria of embarrassment. This is not applicable to everything, but it does apply to religious literature, because religious literature has an agenda other than faithfully recording history. That agenda is to promote and sustain religious faith. The principle of the embarrassment criteria is that if there is anything in a religious document which does not advance that agenda, then it is likely to be true, as we would not expect the author to make such things up. There are other criteria that aren't so useful for New Testament studies, like the credibility of the author. If a document is written by somebody we know is truthful, it's more likely that what they say is true than if they are known to be a lying knave. The problem here is that all four Gospels are full of things that we don't believe. It's not as if we have a fifth Gospel according to Tacitus to compare them with. A further criteria that particularly separates scholars from non-scholars is that scholars don't favour conspiracy theories. That is when multiple events for which we do have evidence are put down to a coordinated effort by multiple people for which we don't have evidence. So, for example, the moon landings produced multiple photographs, films, soundtracks, etc. Conspiracy theories say all this evidence was produced by a coordinated effort of people deliberately trying to deceive the world, and it was all filmed in mock-up on Earth. So they accept that the evidence exists and theorise a coordinated effort of multiple people for which there is no evidence. There's no eyewitness statements from Earth-based cameramen, lunar studio sets, no film outtakes, etc. The reason we don't like conspiracy theories is because they are so easy to concoct. Virtually every major event is subject to some kind of conspiracy theory. Precious few of these theories turn out to be true, and quite a lot of them are started as jokes. A further reason not to believe them is that they tend to make completely unrealistic claims about how effectively large organisations can keep secrets. There are other criteria that can be used to test the veracity of ancient texts, but in secular scholarship these points are going to be the most important. Plain reading, multiple independent sources, consistent with what else we know, embarrassment and no conspiracies without evidence. These constraints apply to scholars not because they are a sure route to the truth, but because they are a route to consensus. So looking first at multiple sources. We do have multiple sources for the existence of Jesus and we don't have any sources for the purely spiritual pre-existent Jesus that mythicists suppose. These sources include the books of the New Testament, Tacitus, Josephus, Pliny the Younger and non-canonical gospels such as the gospels of Peter, Thomas, Judas, etc. Many of the New Testament books appear to be independent of each other. Matthew and Luke are obviously dependent on Mark, and Luke and Acts were written by the same author, but John appears to be independent of the others. Most of what we know about Jesus comes from the Gospels, and we find evidence of multiple sources there. We have Mark, John, the hypothetical Q source, the L source for Luke's material that wasn't in Q or Mark, the M source, which is the equivalent for Matthew, as well as others. So noting that scholars take the plain reading and do not like the idea of multiple authors conspiring to deceive us in the same way, you can see how they conclude that there are multiple independent attestations for Jesus' existence. Then there's the criterion of embarrassment. 
Although this is a generally applicable criteria, it was devised for its best-known example, Jesus' crucifixion. This was a particularly awkward thing for early Christians, and Paul calls it foolishness to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews. It clearly did not advance the agenda of those trying to persuade contemporary Jews that he was the Messiah, and it remains a significant stumbling block to date. Why would you make it up? Incidentally, the crucifixion is the most historicising event in the life of Jesus, not only for this reason, but also because of its multiple attestation. His execution as a criminal is attested throughout the New Testament and by Tacitus, Pliny the Younger and Josephus. Then there's the criteria of consistency. There are many things in the New Testament which are thought to be false because they contain anachronistic comments, like Peter being told that he's going to be the rock on which Jesus will build his church long before the term church was in the vernacular. Also, consistent doesn't only mean historically consistent, it also means consistent with our belief in uniformitarianism, that is, that the laws of nature apply equally in all places and at all times. It is this which discounts miracles. This principle is a very powerful one, so that we know what it says is true, rather than just believing it. So we know Jesus was not raised from the dead. We know that he never raised anybody else from the dead, and we know that he never restored sight to a blind person. But many things we are told about Jesus are entirely consistent with his time period. One of the most consistent is again his crucifixion, because we know that's exactly what Romans did to any political threat in first century Judea. The criterion that's most vigorously challenged by mythicists is, I would say, the independent sources one. They say that all these sources were derived from one fiction rather than one historical life. The problem is that this sounds a bit conspiratorial, with multiple authors conspiring to pull the same deception, and we don't have evidence of any such conspiracy occurring, nor of the pre-existing celestial Jesus figure. Note, though, that the same argument can also be applied to the resurrection, as we also have multiple sources for this. These do include Josephus, but not Tacitus or Pliny. But in this case, we have a very good reason for believing that Jesus was not raised from the dead from uniformitarianism. We have no comparably compelling reason to believe that he never existed. So, in short, the methods of scholarship serve the purpose of gaining consensus, which may not be the same as finding the truth, But, if you learn and practice those methods, and apply them to the evidence we have for the existence of Jesus, you're very likely to believe that he existed, and that is no doubt one of the reasons why a large majority of scholars are historicists.